Hello. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so I uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, gravitational waves. I call it the art and science of gravitational waves. I will try to concentrate on, th on three things. The first is uh, the conceptual revolution that happened with uh, uh, gravitational waves. The second is how difficult it is to catch these gravitational waves. To it's a it's a lesson of patience and insistence and dedication on the the scope. And the third, I will try to make a very fast review of the plethora of the many many results that are coming. So, uh, as you you know already, 14th of September of 2015, it was the first. The gravitational waves that were detected and we'll talk more about it later. So let me go before going to that, let me go some elements of theory. As you know, of course, Galileo by pointing his telescope to the moon was the first to start realizing that the universe was not separated into two areas. One which was the one of Kentessence and Kentessence and the other was the earthly things and that the whole thing was the same and the laws of gravity first of all were the same for for up there and down here and then uh, newton actually after a plague a little bit like the pandemic uh, discovered the laws of gravity uh, which everybody knows m1 and 2 divided by a square but <clears throat> His, uh, what he was saying was that <clears throat> space-time is a fixed framework and inside which bodies move. Having presented space-time like this, it was, there was no way to understand why there is gravitation, or what is the, the, the gravitation. And that's what actually he said, hypothesis non finger. I don't make any hypothesis. It, was, it remained a uh, sort of mystery. So that's one thing. And the second thing, of course, 200 years later, we have also the electromagnetic waves discovered by Maxwell, and uh, which is extraordinary, detected only 10 years later or six, seven years later by Hertz. By doing what? By doing essentially an oscillator, an LC oscillator, creating uh, sparks, and these sparks were oscillating and transmitted electromagnetic waves that were captured a few meters, actually quite a, a few meters away. And, uh, and that was the first uh, logic of waves that we started having. Of course, you know that they thought there was an ether, that there was a, there was a medium that uh, was transmitting this, uh, these, uh, these waves. But then we understood that there was no need of this medium. It actually was with an interferometer, like the gravitational wave interferometer, that was understood that we don't need ether that actually it's the these electromagnetic waves propagate in the vacuum and then we had einstein in 1915 immediately after the uh, uh, special relativity where he says that well i space time is a deformable medium that is mass and energy can deform it and therefore what we call gravitation it is essentially falling of one mass into the influence of the volume space of the other, and vice versa, of course. And then that made the famous, uh, well, probably not so widely known, uh, <clears throat> equation where you have on your left, you have the geometry of space-time, and on the right, you have the distribution of mass and energy. And they are connected with the constant g and the constant of light, c. Of course, this number is a very small number. It's 10 to the minus 43. So in order to see it, you really have to be very, very careful because it is a small. So if one makes, if one tries to make, let's say the Hertz experiment at, uh, at home, takes two tons and, st and distant of one meter, turns them around one kilohertz and stays there at 300 meters away and turn it deep, H, where H, it is a deformation of length, deformation of space, if you wish, deformation of length divided by length, how much the length, any length was changed, is 10 to the minus 35. So it is ridiculously small. You cannot really detect it. So what is the solution here? Actually, if you want the, the formula, you have it here. 
H equals DL over L, you have the G, you have C4 again, you have the, what I've shown before, you have the frequency, you have the distance, you have the masses. So you put, it there, you put this formula and you see that it's a very small one. But uh, you know also that the universe is a place where structure is modulated by violent effects and some of the, one of the violent effects that can be is the coalescence of two heavenly bodies. And there, if you start putting in the place of the mass, 30 solar masses, a distance that is 100 kilometers, a frequency that is normal. And uh, they are very far, 400 megaparsec, I mean, uh, 1,500 uh, million light years. Then you get a deformation of space, which is 10 to the minus 21. This, extraordinarily enough, we can measure, and actually it is one million, one, uh, I'm sorry, one thousandth of a proton radius. So small, but still with interferometric techniques, as we will try to say immediately afterwards, we can detect. Then let's try to remember what are <clears throat> the violent effects in the universe. Violent effects in the universe, producing also some of the candidate sources are, I'm sorry, are the end of stars. A star can end either as a white dwarf, dwarf, as our sun will do, or through a supernova explosion to a neutron star or a black hole. So you have the dead stars would be neutron stars, black holes, and white dwarfs. Further, further on, these things, they either can start coalescing, fall in the orbit of one or the other, till they coalesce and produce a gravitational wave. I'm sorry, it's going on alone. Or they can do through tidal effects, through many other things of accretion, can also produce jets, and all these events produce gravitational waves. So if you want to know what are the candidate sources of gravitational waves, this is coalescing things, black holes, neutron stars, or a black hole and a neutron star. They can be also spinning, continuous sources, spinning neutron stars, for instance. They can be supernova, where I mean, you have the explosion, the moment of the explosion, and also it can be even the Big Bang. The Big Bang was the biggest explosion ever, and there it should have and has done gravitational waves. So we can detect, unfortunately, they are beyond the, the sensitivity of present day, present day detectors. And here you can classify them in, in two uh, uh, coordinates. One is between short events or long events, and also where you know what will be the form of the of uh, the gravitational wave and where you need simulation of many, many, many inputs to understand and you actually just have to detect it. You don't, you don't know what will be the waveform of what you will be detecting. So let's go to detection now. For a long time, we thought we did not know how to do it. Around 57, so it was 40 years later than the, let's say, the prediction of gravitational waves it was, uh, it was in a conference uh, in Chapel Hill conference. It was, it was what, what it was called the, the sticky bit argument that a gravitational wave that will pass will start. I mean, suppose you have two cylinders on a, on a bit, on a, on a cylinder. Oh, no, I'm sorry, two, <clears throat> two, uh, what's, that, what's that? I mean, two round things around a, a, a cylinder. When the gravitational wave will pass, will start elongating and shortening the distance between the two objects. So this is, we try to do that through many ways till it's the point that we thought that the best way to do it as everything, because it's the most sensible th sensitive things we can do through a Michelson interferometer. This I remind you was the one that was also used also for in electromagnetic uh, uh, waves. And how do you do that? You have a laser, you, you put it through a mirror that splits, then goes to two perpendicular directions, it comes back, and coming back you can have it in interference that will be at the dark fringe, as we say, as it will be light, but light is darkness. Sorry, it goes um, alone. Uh, then what will happen? If the gravitational wave passes, when it will pass, it will displace these mirrors and you will move it away from the dark fringe interference. So you will see light appearing. And this little light 
would mean would you can immediately translate that to a delta l over l a difference of the difference of the mirror so this is what we do and uh, let me start with virgo but much bigger three kilometers vacuum pipes and mirrors left and right i will say more about it it's in pisa and uh, let's let's look at it now what are the changes we made one of the changes we what we don't we do what it was called a fabric perot that is we also put another mirror uh, not only the mirror at the end another mirror that starts circulating back and forth the light and therefore you essentially multiply the distance you also multiply the number of photons that are uh, it's a resonant cavity and uh, therefore you are more sensitive to what you expect and they come back the lights these are let's say let's call them semi-transparent mirrors so they come back and then they are recon re reconstructed and they are detected and this is where here at the detection point you would see uh, the interference and before you have to do a lot of things to stabilize to purify the laser and all that okay so then what would you have you would have uh, the di the difference of the two distances l1 and l2 as a as a sort of a form a wave i mean a wave form which then you can analyze in frequency i mean the, the i mean as usually you do a fourier transform and then you can analyze depending on the noises that you have here your sensitivity what is your sensitivity and then you see that you have essentially three areas you have an area which is the low frequency area till let's say 100 even less uh, 20 30 hertz first the one thing one has to to say before that is that it is uh, uh, the frequencies these are the acoustic frequencies you are from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz more or less now when you go to the low frequency uh, your background your noise comes essentially from the environment it is seismicity what we call newton uh, newtonian noise i will be telling you about it and uh, uh, suspensions and all that then in the middle what is the most uh, in the middle frequencies what is most important is the fact that your mirrors have thermal agitation they can because they you know they are they move i mean and their move is above 10 to the minus 8 18 down to the minus 18 meters and in the very high frequencies where your background is is the fact that you don't have enough photons you don't have i mean it is quantum mechanics essentially that puts the limits on your sensitivity so when you do a, a, a interferometer you essentially try to get the best in these three regimes the low frequency the middle frequency and the high frequency so seismic noise you may put it on an inverse pendulum and then you can kill the noise by 10 to the 12. i mean you can silence the vibration by a factor 10 to the 12. what you cannot silence is that when you have seismicity also the ground moves and when the ground moves it's just a wave that passes i mean the ground changes and this newton m1 m2 divided by r square this will change the position of the mirror through this wave this wave you cannot protect it by putting it on a pendulum you have to measure it it is the ultimate noise you have and what you do is you measure it and you try to subtract it another thing that also happens in low frequencies is that light as you as you send it from time to time goes off the axis hits the hits parts of the detector that are not protected with pendula and therefore is vibrated changes frequency and comes back and then again produces noise for you this this fact the fact that we are so sensitive to the environment i make always the joke and people must be tired of listening to me i mean only angels that do not have mass do not uh, affect the gravitational wave detectors everything else does so sea waves the nearby sea waves it's movement of mass this changes the position of our mirrors seismic noise i talked about radio waves because we have electromagnetic parts in our uh, uh, cosmic rays can hit the detector and and the mirrors and therefore create the noise a passage of the way of the of the clouds 
is mass. It's a mass moving. Again, it can create. Don't to say nothing about helicopters and things like that. Uh, anthropogenic noise. So this made a very natural synergy between us and the geoscientists. And we have many programs together. A European program we just uh, uh, put because understanding the world, the cosmos, as a, uh, as a geosphere is for us the prerequisite for understanding the cosmos as universe. The other thing is the middle frequency. The middle frequency there, it's the mirrors is an extraordinary art developed, especially in a French lab called LMA, Laboratoire de Matériaux Avancés. And there we do again a lot of tricks like uh, larger beams, uh, the test, beam, test masses suspended by, by silica and things. In it. It's another big and very interesting art. Third is what I said, lasers. <clears throat> well, we have to increase the, increase the power, but don't forget, you increase the power, then you increase the impact that you have on your mirrors, and therefore you make it move. So we have to, to find the working point between the two. So again, there we must have uh, a lot of, uh, of, of developments in the lasers. I don't have time to go through it and even use new techniques where you play between where you increase the, the amplitude. So therefore you have many photons, so you have less errors. And also when you change it to phase, you rotate the laser to a phase oriented thing. And therefore you have less power and therefore, you do not affect uh, the, the mirrors in their movements in the low frequencies. So in the lower frequencies, you must be in a phase mode. And in the high frequencies, you should be in the amplitude mode. This is called squeezing. This is an extraordinary technique. And this is, again, applied in this here. So if you want the images of all that, you will see it immediately afterwards. This is how it is. You see the mirrors, the injection benches, the vacuum, the vacuum tubes are three kilometers each. This is the second biggest vacuum existing on the earth. The first is the other gravitational wave because they are detector, because they are four kilometers. So many challenges. I will not go back to that. Environmental sensors, mirrors, vacuum, attenuators, quantum sensing and all that. The last uh, thing I wanted to, to say, it's a big challenge on computing because you make an alert and you inform your colleagues you have to do, as we will see immediately afterwards, you have to do it in accordance with your colleagues in the US, for instance, and in Japan soon. And then <clears throat> what you have, you have a system where it's a worldwide alert. You, in a few seconds, you say, I had an event. Did you have the same, et cetera, et cetera. And you try to, co to merge all this information to create an alert that you can put actually the apps, that you can have it, you can be waking in the middle of the night by this app uh, that we have seen an alert. So these are the technology part. It has been a long process. The first Virgo proposal, it was by Giazotto and Briet in 1989. And we saw only 30 years later, we saw the first events. It very, a lot of, of things happened in between. I will not go through them. We don't have the time. But it is you had we you had to believe it, and I had him on my side also to work a lot uh, with the agencies to convince them to do that. One of the instruments we used was ego, uh, trying to explain what's the relation between ego and Virgo. Ego is the consortium where the funding goes through. It is where it is the infrastructure, and tries to help the Virgo colleagues, but also at the same time represent the consortium, promote interdisciplinary studies, R&D, outreach, and education. That's why we're here. Then Advanced Virgo, it's a big collaboration these days. It doubles practically every three years. 600 members, a lot of countries, <coughs> 12 countries. <coughs> Sorry. And actually, since uh, I think five days ago, Greece also, since we we're started with Greece. Science. <coughs> As I told you, we need the, the gravitational wave network. Why? Because we need, in order to identify where the thing is coming, to, to make a network. So we have, for the time being, we have three operating, two in the US, LIGOS, and one in, in Italy, Virgo. 
and one is coming very fast. It is on actually, but does not have yet a sensitivity called Kagura. So our colleagues started earlier. There were the American colleagues, and of course, it is a 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics for Barish, Thorn, and Weiss, very well deserved the Nobel Prize for their persistence. And I told you already that these days we also have Kagra and probably will come in a few years also Indigo in India. So the first event, as we said, was seen by LIGO with the participation of the Vigo collaboration, where we saw two chips, as you see down below. I will show them in a, in a minute. They are well-known chips. The, and you see how they move in frequency. They go from a frequency around 30 hertz to a frequency around the kilohertz, close to the kilohertz. And what what is uh, what happened? Of course, the thing that happened again, everybody knows. You have two black holes that started rotating around each other in a deadly bolero or valse, and then that's uh, and they produce in the beginning, as you can see, they produce simply a wave, a sinusoidal wave. This is called the in spiral phase, and then of course towards the end, if I go faster towards the end, they, you see here the deformation of space that we said about gravitation, uh, gravitation that creates it, towards the end, coalesce and make, and make uh, finally the one object. Something which is very interesting is also this area, what's called the ring down, because here in the ring down, in the final phase, you actually probe what's happening at the surface of these objects. You try to see, are they perfectly, as with, as with Galileo, are they perfectly smooth? Or is there things there, there are this dark matter that has been cut, put there, somehow attracted by gravity. Is there many things? Do they have uh, tides? Do they have, it's a very interesting object to be studied. And of course, this is a famous uh, that has been shown. Uh, and this is why we say for the time, first time, the universe ceased to be silent. It was beautiful before it was beautiful and silent. Now it is beautiful and also we have sound because of course it was not a sound that was emitted simply the frequencies that we have are acoustic frequencies. Second thing that happened was in 2017, when we entered, we, that means Virgo, entered into the game, we tried, now we had three, and we could, could do two things. First, we can identify the place in the sky that this thing was happening. See here, the blue is what the two LIGOs can do, and in green is what you can do when you have three detectors. So from 1,000 square degrees, 1 40th of the, of the sky, you go to 60 square degrees. So much, much better. So then you can say to the astronomers, go there and look, is there something? And the second thing that again takes too much time, we also can measure the polarization of these gravitational waves. And then three days only later, it was summer like this, who everybody remembers how, what an exciting time it was. We had a signal by not this time two black holes, but two neutron stars. And there, the neutron stars are not black holes, so they do not absorb matter around them. They do not absorb everything around them. So light, electromagnetic radiation, everything was able to go away. And so we saw, in, uh, together with a, a Fermi, a, a satellite of gamma rays, we saw events, and, very, and then we, informed the, the, the uh, telescopes and the telescopes in a very small time, they also found where it was coming, found exactly the galaxy from where it was coming. And then we had this fantastic thing. We were able to, to follow one event that was happening. You see here the spectrum of the light was coming. We tried to follow it second by second till many days after, for months, till a few months, we started a few seconds after we saw the process and we saw that the process developing and of course moving uh, from the blue, uh, very hot to red, colder uh, in time. So that was the first thing that we called, it is the first global observation in real time and it is the first thing we called, started multi-messenger astronomy. So other things that happened, again, that were, I mean, it was uh, one event created so many things. 
here, if you can measure, you can measure gravitational waves, the distance where it happened. If you know the galaxy, you know also the speed, and speed by distance gives you the Hubble constant. So you measure the, the expansion of the universe. And if you have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, 20 of these, you, uh, you, because there is currently a problem, we have two measurements of this, of this that do not agree, the measurements of this Hubble constant do not agree. This is a new measurement that will decide what's happening. Then here, the environment in these things that they are called killer nova is so rich in neutrons that you create all the heavy elements that we cannot uh, create in normal sequel stasis. That's why the, the thing that excited most people is was gold, that we're producing gold in there. And of course, it was not only gold, it was many other things. Then, as I said, the fact that you, the two neutron stars come so close you start seeing for the first time a neutron star, an extraordinary object. You have all neutrons gathered in a few kilometers, one on top of the other, only neutrons. Only neutrons, it can be also quarks in there, it can be new matter there, it can be dark matter there, it can be a very... So by examining the surface and the dimensions of these objects, you can be able to understand particle physics in the most, in nuclear physics, in the most big detail. So this run ended by <clears throat> producing a catalog of 10, 11 events, 10 black holes and one neutron star. And then we stopped, we upgraded, and we started last April, and we stopped because of the pandemic, of course, this April. Uh, we had what was called the run 03. In the run 03, you see the rate of events we were measuring and how it went up. We are currently around the close to 70 events total, 56 was in 03, a lot of events. We have one event every week. And you have to know here that if you increase the sensitivity by a factor of two, you increase the number of uh, events that you see by two to the cube. You understand why? Because it's the radius versus volume. And there you have two to the cube, so a factor of 10. So we will go very soon to one black hole, neutron star, or what have you per hour and even more. So then uh, another thing that is very interesting is that you have what we call neutron stars, neutron stars. The neutron stars can have up to 2.53 solar masses by the physics, that was is physics of the 30s. And then you have black holes that we believed up to now that they can start from five uh, solar masses and above and they actually stop somewhere here. Well, all this is in, in starts to be in doubt because we start seeing strange events and these are i will show you some strange events for instance there is this 1904 12 what it means it was year 19 april 12 of april we first saw something that was a uh, had significantly different masses it was 30 solar masses and eight solar masses and this was very interesting because we, well, for our own reasons because you can see multiple frequencies and therefore you can entangle a lot of information about how this thing happened but also it's very strange that you have two so different uh, black holes the other thing that happened was another neutron star merger but again it was not clear is it a neutron star or a black hole all these things the increase of sensibility we would help us do things and the last uh, that we published and there are many more coming stay tuned during the summer <clears throat> It was again a very big uh, 20, 23 solar masses black hole with an object that looks to be between the neutron star area and the black hole. So is this, this gap really a gap? We don't know. So this is what we call the stellar graveyard. All the things we saw, you see here one, how two black holes coalesce to make one. And you see two things. The first thing that you see is that we see the black holes we see they are bigger than the ones that were seen in astronomy before through astronomical data. And then you have the neutron stars below, and the, this is this event that we just said that was that was that create was created uh, by in this intermediate region that we don't know yet uh, it, what it means. How is it the stability of this object is there? So I will not go through that. I think I took too much time. The message here is, it's not only gravitational waves, it's astronomy, it's cosmology, it's particle physics, it's testing quantum mechanics, I didn't have time to go through it, etc., etc., etc. 
it is a real scientific revolution. Future. In the future, we had, I talked about O3, we just finished. We have two upgrades of the detector that we'll call O4 and O6. That, as I said, we will, at least in Virgo, will increase by a factor of four, the hour uh, sensitivity. That means a four to the cube more sources. We will be able to connect better to what uh, Sophocles was just showing. Neutrino detectors, uh, uh, space satellites, optical surveys. We have the big optical survey of the CST coming in, etc. CTA, high energy photons, and all that. And then I will not go through what we have to do. We have to, to work on the quantum part, the frequency dependent squeezing, and we have to work on the mirror part uh, in order to have this extra sensitivity. So this I will not say more. And then the other things that are coming, it is we're not alone. As I said, we are looking from 10 kilohertz, 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. But if you go to lower frequencies, then you start seeing other masses heavier masses, and this would be LISA, the gravitational uh, wave uh, interferometer in space, and even smaller ones where you take the black holes at the centers of the, of the galaxies, a million to a billion black hole masses, and all this will try to understand this distribution and make a new cartography of, this, of the universe with gravitation. And of course, as I said, Cosmology is, I mean, the inflation and all that is a little bit further away. So I feel a big, a big program. This is, if you take the, the classical image of the universe and how it was made from the Big Bang, uh, let's say advanced vehicle, we go up to redshift of one, I mean, meaning, I don't know, meaning a billion years in black, in black holes or let's say 300 million in neutron star, 300 million uh, parsec in neutron star, but the next generation we're preparing called third generation uh, Einstein telescope and LISA will go up to the point where the, the galaxies were made. I mean, we'll see the formation of galaxies, the black holes as they were forming and things like that. Why not also probe dark matter possibility. So in order to serve all this, we have a big program and now I'm finishing. I, the things I, of course, frontiers, I will not talk about that. You will be hearing a lot. The things that we have visits, we'll see a vi the, the first test later on, the first test that we do in the times of the pandemic through a, a sort of remote visit where you say it's live, but remote. Then we have a citizen science program where parts of the analysis of our data, we give it to the citizens to ask them to help us identify some of the signals, what they are. Are they just noise or are they a significant thing? And this is a very exciting program called Rainforce. We are collaborating with at least uh, two or three people in Frontiers. And of course, we also have an art and science program we made there. So this is a Rainforce. This is this what we call glitches and how we try to identify them with the use of citizens. And then another thing that we do there, and then again, I want to thank Rosa Doran that she introduced us to the fantastic lady called Wanda Diaz Merced, that is an astronomer that became blind at the age of 20. And then she decided not to stop, but to sonify the astronomical data to be so that blind people can also participate. And not only that, I think, I believe strongly that analyzing data through acoustic and not only through visual will increase our capabilities to separate signal from background. So Rhythm of Space also had, uh, I think, a very nice exhibition with very big names. Thomas Sarasano is one of the 10 most famous artists these days in the world, Lillian Lean and others. Uh, in Pisa, and this is other activities to serve the revolution because the scientific revolution needs to be served properly. So this is essentially what I wanted to say. The gravitational waves addresses many fields of fundamental science. Multi-messenger science has started with this discovery of neutron stars. There is a continuous path, so it's not something that will stop tomorrow. We have many years in front of us, we just started. There is a lot of synergies with environmental thinking, social risks, geoscience, and all that. 
a lot of synergy with quantum mechanics and quantum sensing. Computing is again at the forefront of development. And of course, I think uh, you believe uh, that we, there is a great potential of outreach, education, engagement, social, and this is where we ask your help. So that's it essentially. I'm sorry if I took more time. Thank you very much, Professor Casanevas, uh, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, do we have any questions?